Hello, world. My name is Kenzie Dodds, and you are watching Angular Air. Um, and we are excited to chat today about Angular and data and the future, um, and yeah, what the future holds for Angular and data management. So, um, before we get started, I'll just introduce our guests and our panelists. So we have Jeff Cross. Go ahead and say hi, Jeff. Hello. And I'll just focus on them. Um, and we have Alex uh, Rickabaugh. Hello. And you can correct my, my pronunciation of your last name, by the way. Oh, that was perfect. If it's Jeff Bacross or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ian Riley. Hey. Um, thanks for coming on the show, everybody, uh, or guests. Um, and then we have our panelists, uh, Patrick J.S. Hey, guys. If you're not watching like live and you're listening on an audio podcast, I recommend you watch so that you can see Patrick's sweet new mustache. <laughs> uh, and uh, and his artwork on our our guest uh, Twitter handles is is appreciated as well. Um, and we have Amy Knight. Hello. And Jeff Lovely. Hello. And Olivier Combe. Hi. And it's really hot where Olivier is at. 40 yep. Celsius, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, OK, so let me just go over a co couple of quick announcements. Uh, next week's show is July 14th, and it's featuring Angular Formly uh, with me. Uh, so you can go find the Twitter thread where that idea popped up from um, uh, Mike Harrington. For that. Yeah, so that should be a good show, I hope. Uh, we're going to have a special guest host. Should I spoil the beans, Jeff, or that's kind of up to you, that show? Well, hold on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as always, follow us on Twitter and Google+. Plus. Um, we're ang at Angular Air, um, and find us on the web at angular-air.com. Okay, so enough with the announcements. Um, let's get into our content. So... Um, yeah, we, we have um, Jeff and um, Alex and Ian here because they are doing work on Angular 2 and data. Um, and so if you could give us a brief overview of the past and then talk with us about the future, I think that would be a good way to, to kickstart us. Sure. Well, can you still hear us OK? Yes. OK, great. Uh, so the past of data and Angular. Um, Alex and I both worked on uh, data with Angular in some form. He, he was working on a project um, uh, that uh, is a Google CRM tool, and he was building a project that worked with Angular Dart called Streamy uh, that was meant to make uh, data move more seamlessly in applications. And I was working, meanwhile, on AngularJS 1.x, where we didn't really do much for data. We, we have an HTTP library, the dollar HTTP. Uh, we have a cookie service, and we have um, and, and resource, yeah. resource, which which most people, most projects used it to get started, but everyone ended up implementing their own version of resource to do something they needed done. That resource was going to be extended. Yeah, I used resource uh, actually in a previous project too, and uh, one of the main problems I had with it was it just didn't fit any existing backend out there. Like if you're using resource, you, you know, it was restful, but not quite enough to work with an arbitrary REST service. It was some um, yeah, it's some little gotchas that you had to watch out for. So, and so yeah. be beyond that, the framework, um, you know, all parts of the framework deal with data in some way. Um, there is the getting data from a server. There's the binding data to templates. There's there's the writing data from forms. Um, and Angular one, in a lot of ways, it, it did some of those things pretty well for its time. Uh, like forms to about two way data binding was was kind of new, uh, but it still had this kind of model of um, of a RESTful backend, you get data, you use it in the application, every once in a while you push it back. Um, whereas applications now are starting to, to be a little bit more different. Uh, they want to support real-time data better, they want to move it back and forth. Uh, they want to uh, support offline, especially with, with so many users coming online in markets where networks aren't very good uh, and where the mobile hardware isn't as good. Um, they want the apps to be resilient in those situations when, when network flakes. And so, um, so we took we looked a lot at, at Angular One and, and the things we're doing, and also where apps are, are right now, where apps should be going or want to be going. And, and we looked at uh, how we could in Angular Two solve some of these problems better uh, by 
one, having a good HTTP story, which is the first thing we've, we've been focusing on in Dear 2. Uh, and then making the open, and one thing we'll talk about a little bit is observables, making observables our first class facing data primitive uh, so that uh, we can treat data as being living instead of something that's resolved and then done that, that we have a promise as many of one. Uh, and also we're going to focus on making native uh, native platform APIs more testable and simpler to use. Things like uh, local storage, index DB, service worker, web sockets, um, things that they, they give power, but they're, it's not always clear the best way to use them, and it's not always clear how to test these services as well. Um, so that's kind of where we were and where we're trying to go with Angular 2 and how we're starting to think about it. So Jeff, I'm just curious with one thing you just said, um, that the philosophy with Angular 1 was always that the data layer was something that in user land people could deal with, that like the data layer was very light, and that was kind of supposedly done uh, on purpose. And no doubt there's a need for all the stuff that you just mentioned because people create it anyways. But I'm just curious as to what changed the philosophy in the core team to actually start working on, on that as part of core. Uh, I think a lot of it was was users asking more for these things. Um, and and there, so there are great libraries that have come out and solved a lot of these problems. Like Vestangular is a good one that people use instead of resource, uh, follow resource. Um, and uh, there's the Angular data or the Angular, uh, I think you remember the JavaScript or But lots of projects that solve these problems. But, um, but uh, people wanted the core to, be, to have more um, ways of doing these simple things. Uh, and, Angular 1 is actually kind of hard because any, if you wanted to use other APIs or uh, native platform APIs that, that Angular didn't support, you would have to deal with digest. Uh, you would have to deal with um, digest in progress, making sure you weren't um, causing a digest while there's already one happening so, so that your app didn't crash or throw an exception. Um, so you wouldn't miss updates. Right? Yeah, and, and, it's, uh, and also coalescing digest because digests are expensive if you have a lot of bindings in Angular 1. It could be expensive if, if you've written your app in such a way. So there's a lot of optimizations that, that you have to do and a lot of deep knowledge of the framework you have to have to, to like if I wanted to use WebSockets, I would have to build a pretty heavy wrapper around it. Um, so people wanted to do these things. And so it's kind of a combination of people saying, we want we want something simpler. We want to be able to do these things more easily, as well as us trying to look at where the web is going, at where uh, users are going. And, and that's, that's where a lot of the offline priority comes from, is looking at this next billion users who are in um, places with, with worse network, who, who uh, need more resilient data um, access in the framework so application developers can more easily accommodate them. That was a really long, rambling answer. I hope that was good. something of what you asked. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was helpful. Um, so, it sounds like, or sort of like, um, dollar resource was intended to try and be restful so that it would accommodate for more uh, or as many use cases as possible, and it, uh, it sort of fell short in, in many areas. Um, and so that's why we see these libraries pop up that, that kind of cover more use cases. Um, but like these libraries, um, like it, it is a big challenge to try and cover a lot of use cases, and that's why there are just so many different use or, or libraries out there to cover these use cases. So is um, the work that you guys are working on um, going to cover many use cases, or, or how are you going? How are you uh, trying to make sure that you cover as many use cases as, po as possible without like making it a really difficult uh, interface? So uh, we're coming at it from two ends, really, uh, and Alex can talk about one of them, but. But we're, we're first focusing on the, the low-level stuff in the platform already, in the web platform, and saying, OK, people who want to do it themselves, they want to build their own libraries, so they've got big applications with those specific needs. Let's make things like local storage and NXDB and WebSockets and Service Worker easier to work with and easier, easier to test and, um, and to play well with other parts of Angular 2. Uh, as well as, let's make Angular 2 play more nicely with these native APIs if they wanted to use them directly. Um, by removing the, thing, the, the things that made it difficult in Angular 1, like digests. So with zones, um, we've eliminated a lot of that friction where you could use XML HTTP request, or fetch, or all these different asynchronous APIs in the browser without having to worry about digests because we handle it for you, we handle it for you. And so that's kind of the low part of where we're starting. In the middle, we, we still see libraries uh, 
solving a lot of these these uh, application, these domain-specific problems. Um, like REST Angular should still be a library, for example. It does a lot, and it's really opinionated. Um, and there are so many different backends and ways people access data that, that we certainly don't want to um, say that we can solve all problems for everybody in the core of Angular. So we're, we're starting at this low level to make things simpler, and maybe we'll evolve some layers on top of that. But on the other end, Alex and Ian are working on a project called Tactical uh, that's focusing on a, on a higher level framework that understands a little bit more about data and, and gets some more hooks. Uh, you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we can talk about that now. Uh, sure, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, so um, our project is called Tactical. Um, I'll explain where the name comes from. But um, basically, the, the premise is that offline is a hard problem, and especially so if you have kind of you're trying to build your application within an existing um, infrastructure that doesn't really uh, isn't really designed with that in mind. So if you're building an application from the ground up today, you have a lot of different choices. You can go with Firebase or Netflix Falcor. Um, you can use the project of Lovefield, which does um, that has a real query engine. Um, um, but if you have an existing backend, then it becomes kind of hard to, um, to implement offline functionality on top of it. And so uh, we're building a project called Tactical. Uh, yeah, Tactical. Um, yeah, that tries to support offline um, on kind of your average everyday backend. And the way we do this is we um, we kind of focus on the optimistic use case. So normally, if you're if you're doing an operation offline and you try to commit some changes, um, you know most of the time there's not going to be a conflict. Everything's going to go through just fine. But it can fail, and so we have to accommodate that. Um, yeah, you want to add anything? No, I think that you covered most of the really good points. Um, I think one of the, the biggest problems with offline is what do you do whenever a connection is reestablished. And I think that's a big problem that we're focusing on with tactical. And I think what makes it so difficult, one of the reasons why it is so difficult to build offline on top of an existing application is solving that, that use case of, well, what happens whenever they've been offline for an hour and they've done a lot of stuff and now they're coming back online and other people have been making changes as well. Um, and how do you synchronize those? So tactical is focusing on that as a as a major um, challenge and you know, a major obstacle uh, for so. Yeah, we actually had the Firebase uh, a couple Firebase people on a couple weeks ago, and they talked about all the effort that they put into their clients to uh, deal with offline and like it sounds super super complex. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, well, one of the main problems is that. The, just the way people are used to writing applications, they assume connectivity. Like, you know, you, you generally don't worry about your, your error path. If you handle HTTP errors at all, you usually just put up a bar saying, hey, you're having trouble connecting. Maybe you need to refresh. Um, it's, it's actually a really different way of thinking to start to deal with, OK, you know, am I connected now? How connected am I? You know, some, a lot of applications have this switch. Ian has a great example of this. But have a switch between am I online or am I offline, and they try to go between and do different things in, in you know, each case, and it just almost never works the way yeah. it's intended to. Yeah, I ran into a problem last uh, last semester at school because I was I'm really interested in Spotify, and Spotify has an offline online app, and of course you have to pay for the offline app. And so I'll bike ride to class, I'll be passing through multiple different uh, Wi-Fi zones, and the way that Spotify works is if you're online and you go offline, it actually reboots the application. So I'll be right in the middle of a song, and I'm like biking along, enjoying my song, and all of a sudden it just stops. And then five seconds later, it just starts from the beginning. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just that type of design mentality. Um, there needs to be a much more fluid process for applications to transition between online to offline, offline to online, or somewhere in the middle where it's you know, it's I'm online, but my connection is so slow um, that my app is nearly unusable. So, so what's the strategy that you guys are implementing for that? So, our, yeah, our strategy is basically um, serve. Just always assume that you're offline and try to serve everything locally. Uh, and the problem with that in a lot of applications is you end up having you know a backend that has really complex logic, and in order to do this. Perfectly on the client side, you basically end up re-implementing your backend in JavaScript and coming up with some sort of synchronization strategy. 
So you'll have you know some API that you access for your Spotify application or some other application, and you re-implement that API in JavaScript against IndexedDB or local storage or something like that. And then you have to come up with, okay, now I have this local model which is diverged from the server model since the user's been offline. How do I sync it? Uh, and that works really well, but you kind of have to design your both your backend and your application around the idea that you'll eventually be synchronizing. And so our model is, is slightly different. We um, have decided to treat the backend as basically a giant key value store. Where the key is a request that you make to get some data, and the value is the data that comes back. Um, and that way we can assume that you can always cache data by its key, by the request that you make to get it. It's kind of a generic model that applies to a lot of different backends. Um, and the way we deal with the synchronization issue is to assume that we will never uh, attempt to merge divergent states. So if the user makes a change offline and the, in the meantime someone else changes it on the back end, when we reconnect, we we'll detect that there's a difference and we'll notify the application and ask it what to do. And the application can perform a merge because it understands its data or it can just notify the user that, hey, that edit that you made seems invalid now. There's a new version, a new value for that field. So the project is, is pretty early, uh, although they've, they've spent a lot of time designing it. Uh, but you can track it on the Angular slash tactical repo. And we're trying to add more information there, uh, explaining it. And we, we open issues there that also can be tracked to, to show what the progress is. is so is this uh, Angular 1 as well? Because like, it's outside of uh, Angular 2? Disconnected from Angular 2. We may do some integration with Angular 2 um, in a separate module to make things a little easier to use, but uh, the current thinking is that, yes, it will be usable for the end of the It may even be, you know, a, a part of the migration story. It's really good. All right. Can you, can you tell us more about observables? Because, like, um, I'm sure, like, a lot of our viewers <coughs> and everyone in the Angular community um, keeps hearing about these observables and they don't replace promises and uh, someone moved my cheese. Um, can you tell me how um, observables are going to be first class in, in Angular and in Angular data, um, just as Promises was in the past, and how like um, the community was doing the exact same thing previously uh, with callbacks versus Promises, and then Promises 1, um, and then now it's like observables versus Promises, but practically the same, uh, with slight, very subtle differences, and it's really easy to pick up. Um, yeah, can you just give me more on more on that. So I think this the idea of moving to observables probably started uh, late last year, uh, where Joffer Hussein came in to talk to us, um, and uh, we knew Joffer like uh, just from uh, mutual acquaintances at Netflix, BitMash, um, and uh, he's passionate about observables because he's working on a spec for observables for for um, TC for the uh, ECMAScript community for TC39. Um, and so he came into us, and uh, and he tried to convince us that we should use observables for everything in Angular. And we all said, no, that's ridiculous. We shouldn't. What about things that are just one-offs, like an HTTP request? And he said, good question. And showed us all these reasons why we should use observables for HTTP requests and for uh, other things that we think is one-offs because of um, lots of benefits you get from observables. So observables, like you said, they're, they're like promises. Um, they're an asynchronous wrapper around some value that will eventually resolve or reject uh, and compete. Uh, but they have a lot of different semantics. Uh, and the most notable one is that they can represent many values over time. Uh, so they represent not necessarily, uh, they can represent, represent a sequence of values. Um, so a, a promise, you get a value and you're done, uh, and, uh, and it continues whatever promise chain you've created as part of that. So, so that's the biggest difference. But, but uh, the, the features of observable that make it more composable are that uh, they're cancelable, for one. So this is great for HTTP requests. Um, if I have a series of requests, like for an autocompleter, if I'm typing in a text input uh, changes um, to some kind of um, autocompleter service, uh, if I type in more data and uh, want to get fresh data for that other computer. I want to cancel the previous request that's still pending so I'm not using this resource in my browser, uh, my connection pool resource and other resources allocated for that request. 
or cancel the previous one, perform a new one, and wait for that. Um, so that's another part. And also, if, if you don't care about a request anymore, like if I'm disposing of a component, um, I want to um, I want to cancel the request and cancel any follow-up work that would have been done on that request. Where as a promise, once it's done, it goes through the chain of promises and it's done. And there are ways with promise you can hack around it by throwing an exception inside of a promise, but, um, but with observable, these kinds of things are more natural. Uh, and the other semantic that's nice is the idea of cold observables. And I see your mustache growing and getting smaller. Are you doing that, or is that just the computer vision? Yeah. Oh, I, I think Patrick's just playing around with his, his new... I'm talking directly to you, and I don't feel like I'm being hurt. <laughs> Patrick, you're so rude. <laughs> Stop shaving, bro. <laughs> I, I don't want to go too much further than observables, but they, they offer a lot of flexibility in composition and performance and ergonomics. They compose well with other parts of the framework, like forms, which will also, like form input, form control events will be observable-based. And you can do all sorts of things like uh, you know, mapping on those and um, all, all the other crazy combinators that are available with, with RxJS. Retry. Retrying is... Filtering. With yeah. HTTP, if, if you look at... Um, I have a design doc. Um, I have, if you look at HTTP and Angular 2, you can see some of the things that, uh, that are possible with it, like um, retrying requests, um, having dynamic retries of requests based on certain conditions. Um, polling is, is a lot simpler. Short polling and long, long polling. Um, those fit nicely with the observable paradigm. There's a lot that the framework doesn't have to do that observables already do for you if, if you take some time to, to learn how to do it. So it, it uh, gives us a lot of data for them. Yeah, it sounds great. So essentially, it's observable is, a, is a, like, a, like a standard protocol uh, that's going to be in ES7. Um, so that way, we can interact with pretty much every asynchronous um, call with it and then have this standard way to compose everything. Um, can you, is this also going to be uh, the same with the uh, animations? It, it is. I'm not sure exactly how uh, Matthias sees it playing out, but he's in the process of, of um, he may have already given it all the thought and design. But, um, but yeah, he's, he's working on uh, facing observables and animations because, like, like you said, it fits so nicely with the idea of canceling an animation that's in progress and, and you know, backing out of it. Um, better than promises. I think we need to have an entire show on observables with Angular. Um, there. Victor would be a great person to have on again to talk about it. Uh, he'd give them a lot more scientific explanation than I would probably. Oh, that'd be cool. He's yeah. working on the forms implementation that's uh, observable based, which you talked about I think last week or week before. Yeah. Yeah, and he talked about uh, observables being in use for, I think, validation and, well, not validation, but uh, like when on changes and stuff like that. But um, yeah, that would be cool to chat about. So um, we sort of sort of talked about this, sort of not, um, but Pascal wanted to ask a question about um, offline first in general. So uh, he's specifically asking about service workers. So um, is there any plan to integrate with service workers for um, Angular 2 data, or uh, what's the plan there? Absolutely. So um, we, we really believe that in, in sort of the, the future of the web application is that our, every application will just kind of work, whether you're online or offline or in between. And the users will demand that. But, you know, it's really frustrating when you're, you're going through a subway tunnel or something and trying to load a web page. It half loads and then stops working from that point on. You have to regret because the app hasn't considered that it might not have an internet connection. Um, and part of that story is making Angular um, applications work really well offline. Uh, so we want to build either a, you know, either a service worker ourselves or at least some integration for one so that an, an Angular developer with their Angular application can, you know, set a few things up and get their app to start loading offline. Uh, all of the templates, all of the JavaScript, HTML, et cetera, uh, via service worker. So, uh, do most people know what service worker is? That would probably be a good thing to uh, give an overview about. Yeah, it's, it's a new uh, new spec, which I think the spec is, uh, I think it's pretty solid. I, I, I think it's um, whatever that paper where it's got consensus and it's being implemented. 
Uh, but it's being implemented in browsers now. Um, Chrome and Firefox have some portions of Service Worker left. There's this big spec that encompasses a lot of things. It encompasses um, a different kind of web worker that can be registered with an application and can stay running in the background even when an app isn't open. Uh, I think that part of it isn't implemented yet in most browsers. But, uh, but you, you can do things like intercept um, HTTP requests from the application and decide um, if you want to get them from this cache object that's also part of the service worker spec, if, if you have it there, and then respond uh, directly without making another request. Or if you want to um, uh, fetch the resource yourself using this new API called fetch, that's also uh, kind of part of this bigger service worker spec. Um, so it's it's kind of like uh, app manifest, the, um, is that what it's called, application manifest API, but it's a lot more imperative. Uh, it's it's um, been thought through a lot more, mostly as a result of how painful it was to work with um, app manifest. Plus one to that pain, man. Uh, it's such a pain. And dangerous. You can you can actually screw some things up pretty badly if you misuse app cache. So so we're looking at ways to um, so Roddy Haddad is working on uh, a CLI tool based on Ember CLI for Angular two, maybe Angular one. I think it's Angular two, uh, but that will make generating apps simpler. And we're looking at how to, as part of that process, also generate some helpers that could be used inside of Service Worker, or, or even generate a fully functional Service Worker for you. So that's pretty early right now, but the, so that's kind of the static asset side we're looking at, and we're also thinking about how to um, make the data access, the real model data access simpler inside of Service Worker. Yeah, it's true that you can really screw things up with um, App Cache because <laughs> I was once uh, working with Sencha, and uh, they have this uh, offline stuff doing the App Cache for you, and I my, misconfigured my my application and misconfigured. And then uh, people started downloading the app, and they never uh, got any new new files. Mm -hmm. And on, only if they clear the cache from their browser could they get the new app. So yeah, that's really hard. <laughs> yeah. That's easy to make irreversible changes. <laughs> yeah. On the HTTP caching headers, I think. Caching headers are one of those things that most people only think about when they stop working. So if you don't actually you know, consider that you have to set it in the beginning in order for app cache to not break. There are so many things we build our applications on top of that we don't understand. <laughs> cool. So uh, I, I know some of us are wondering about um, what's happening to dollar HTTP in, uh, in Angular 2. I know uh, there's a HTTP service in Angular 2. Is, can you talk about how that differs, um, or if it's only like the fact that it's observable since the promises, or, or what else is, is changing? Yeah, the, uh, so this is kind of the first thing in core that's really data-centric that, um, that has been committed. Um, it's, it's really, in a lot of ways, the API is similar to Angular 1, uh, HTTP, except there, it's um, not as in Angular 1, we had this big config object you would pass to HTTP that could have all these things like a cache factory instance and um, transformers and uh, what else could be on the config object? Um, things that would that would declaratively describe here is HTTP. Here's how to handle um, this request. And in addition to the config you would pass into HTTP, you could find some things on a global config. Um, HTTP.defaults.config or something. Uh, or maybe just defaults with the object. Name. And you could, anywhere inside an application, you could mutate these, these properties on this global config. And for big teams, this is problematic uh, because um, for interceptors, I could actually declare it in a config phase and then nobody can touch it after that. But for transformers, I could declare it anywhere within my app at any time. And so we, we would see these weird side effects if some component had added this response transformer and another component had no idea it was there and was doing something to request or to response and um, and you have to track down okay where what's being evaluated that's actually setting this this transformer and how can we play nicely together because they obviously want this thing for some route but I don't need it here or we're working with different backends so that these transformers don't apply universally to all black backends um, so we're with the new version of Angular's HTTP. 
uh, we focus on a, a lot more on do it yourself these kinds of things uh, for transformations and preparing requests uh, by creating a service that will prepare requests and transform them and, and uh, also can perform the requests and then um, handle errors and do the kinds of things you would do with these config objects before. And it gives users more control so I can create a service uh, that just works with a particular API that has its own um, constraints and it would requires its own types of headers for authentication, and uh, I may want to do different strategies for retrying for this API, and if I know every once in a while I'm giving the 500, and I should just push on, then I can do that, um, rather than encouraging these, these global configuration, uh, the global configuration object share for all HTTP requests. Um, and, you know, observables fit so nicely into transformations, and they give you a lot more power for what kind of transformations you can perform. Uh, that we didn't want to say that you can give us a transforms array that, that will then step through each time there's a response and evaluate it. We want to encourage users to more use like map, and filter, and uh, yeah, the other features are mm -hmm. So it's still early though, we're still thinking about it, and we, we still want to make sure that these things are simple and straightforward and easy. Uh, and there's, I have a big issue open talking about the interceptors design that's on the Angular slash Angular repo if anyone wants to. Uh, chime in on it and say, if there's this use case that you're not thinking about, or if there's something that would be really painful if you don't change this, uh, we're looking for that kind of thing. Great. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, fantastic that you, you're um, open with your design documentation. So anybody interested, very easy to contribute um, feedback. So yeah, talking about the design doc, I read it a long time ago, and in October, I think. Uh, you talked about data persistence uh, with something similar to local forage from Mozilla that would um, uh, abstract uh, the use of um, uh, all async stores, uh, such as uh, local storage and uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, is it still on the to-do list, or? I, I don't, so it may be, but we're more focused on, um, I wouldn't even call it an abstraction, more as a wrapper. Of, like, so right now we're, we're planning on doing direct one-to-one -one wrappers of the session storage, local storage, um, while doing a couple of things that make it more mockable for testing and also um, maybe a layer above it that would be more observable based where you could actually subscribe to certain changes uh, as long as changes go through your um, through our service and your service that you could um, um, you can subscribe to a key for example and whenever somebody through this API pushes it sets that key again you get updated about it. Um, and I think in that design doc I had said there would be kind of a la layer above session stores, local stores, and index DB where yes. Uh, and an interface also. So, Something. so I'm not sure if if, if I if that will be on the roadmap. If there are um, if there's enough demand and not a third party library that does it well, then maybe we would bring that as something that the person focuses on. Um, but it's just right now not I had a uh, quick question that um, yeah I was curious about. So with uh, the testing story with HTTP, uh, we have the HTTP backend uh, with Angular 1, um, and once you learn it, it's fairly easy to test, but I'd really love for it to be even easier. Um, is there, what, what, like, I realize that HTTP and Angular 2 is pretty, like, in, in development, but um, do you have any comments on the testing story for Angular 2 uh, and testing HTTP requests and mocking those out? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's so there is a it's it kind of similar to Angular one where we have so actually we'll have different connection uh, different ways of making connections uh, depending on different backends. So right now we have an XML HTTP request backend is the only backend that's supported. Uh, Caitlin's working on a JSONP backend, and that will actually be a different uh, API that user would use. So it would be the same interface, but you would use something called like HTTP JSONP to make the request. Whereas in Angular 1, you just pass, I think there's a method that JSON key on which you have to. So a little bit different from there. Um, but So let's talk about the XML HTTP request backend, how it is right now. We have, um, similar to Angular 1, this backend that you can inject into your tests uh, called XHR backend. Um, and 
actually, no, mock backend that implements the same interface as XHR backend. And on there, you, in Angular 1, you would you would uh, declare all expected requests ahead of time. You would say expect get um, or expect and then the method and the URL uh, to say, in my test, I'm going to make these requests. Uh, you should expect them, and optionally, you should respond to them like this. Uh, in Angular 2, and I think most of this thinking was Pete Bacon Darwin's design uh, for, for thinking about HTTP for Angular 1 and also thinking for the Angular 2. Uh, we wanted to make that a little bit more in-band in your tests. So instead of saying beforehand, here's everything I expect, and if, if I get a request I don't expect, then throw an exception, fail a test. Um, we say you, you uh, perform your requests in kind of the order you're expecting to. Uh, so I could call a service that I know makes an HTTP request, and then the next line I can say um, connection.respond, or connection uh, filter by this URL, then respond to uh, with this response, and then after that I can check that everything worked as it was expected. And we still provide the methods that verify there's nothing pending, you know, that every connection has been resolved, um, so, so that uh, you can, can throw after the test is done if, if something happened that wasn't expected. And cool. it's, it's observable based too, so this backend has a connections observable that you subscribe to, and then uh, once the connection gets through to it, you can um, assign it to some outer variable and do it. And that makes it nice because then you can just call filter on it and then you get the connection that matches the URL that you're expecting and test against that. So that's also still pretty early, but um, pretty on par with Angular 1. Well, one thing awesome. I really like about this design is it lets you kind of control the order in which requests get resolved. And that can be important in some scenarios for kind of testing odd cases where there's requests that you don't expect to finish very quickly goes back very quickly. Mm -hmm. No race conditions. Yeah. Both before and after one that was really hard to test into, right? That sounds a lot more straightforward. Uh, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. no, there's no flushing now either. Yay. So I have a question. Um, you know, one common optimization technique when you are using server rendering is to include the model data serialized within the HTML that's passed down from the server and then have at the client side, instead of making another database call, it instead uses that just for like the initial page load this is. Mm -hmm. And I've done various times where I kind of implement that myself or whatever. Um, but I was curious if that's something that you guys, it sounds like it would fit in like with a somewhat similar type of thing to an offline online type of thing, except instead of like local storage, you're pulling from this other source, you know, in the actual uh, HTML document. Uh, is that something that you guys have played around with or um, we, we, play around, on? we played around with that approach with Angular 1 a while back when we were testing, doing some server side rendering testing. I know it's something that's still been brought up as as we experiment with server side rendering in Angular 2. Um, I don't think that's the first strategy they're going for though. I think the first strategy they're trying is actual partial rendering. Uh, rendering, you know, the, uh, the most important content. Uh, so for search engine optimization and for content sharing, uh, making it easy for Angular to render one piece of content but leave the rest of the page to be um, compiled and, and rendered uh, after it's been loaded, if that makes sense. Um, so that we're actually, we actually ship down the HTML page with some content, the, the most important content, and then, um, and then uh, the front end does the rest of it. Um, I haven't been, I haven't kept up that much with the work. It's just a couple of conversations I've had, so I'm not sure if that approach has changed. Uh, I think, I think Tobias is probably the one focusing most on that story right now. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's something that uh, the, the it's one thing for the content to be there displayed, and then it's just a matter of whether the client is making that extra call to refetch the data um, later. But uh, it sounds like even if it's something that you guys don't build into the library, that something will be able to fit in just uh, in, on a user basis can uh, add to what you guys already have. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a good optimization, and I'm sure I'm sure it will be part of the strategy. I, I think um, I think the first case they're solving is more the screen scraping and search engine optimization case, and I think performance is the third spoke in that wheel. But performance was uh, with our testing in Angular One. It was the performance was always pretty equivalent. 
um, for for some applications uh, when you would do server side rendering and and, uh, and then take over versus just running everything on the client. Uh, and there's these other two things that were blocked completely by um, by lack of server side rendering. And so those became higher priorities that the constant scraping the scrapers aren't quite smart enough to scrape dynamic content yet, and search engines are still catching up on being able to understand uh, some of the feedback. So. Uh, performance is, uh, is obviously one of the bigger focuses of Angular 2, and, and I'm sure this, this model will come into play. I had a super quick question going back to Kent's earlier. Um, so not everybody you know, probably wants to do this, but we had a use case where we wanted to mock uh, our end-to-end -end tests. So we're actually using a library that uses HTTP backend proxy, um, and it's like an API over protractor. So is there any... Uh, Thought in doing something like that native in Angular or no? Uh, how does HTTP backend proxy work? You, like, is that a special service HTTP backend proxy, or you're just using? Oh, you're using HTTP backend inside of your end-to-end -end test. Yes, yes, it uses um, like what you're using for your unit testing in your uh, backend or in your end-to-end -end testing. Um, I would think that it wouldn't. I would think that would be pretty simple to, uh, maybe. So there's nothing, like, they're not planning on putting anything into Protractor that would, like, abstract away any of that, because we're just using a library that does it right now. I think we could. I could talk to Julie about it. Uh, <laughs> we just haven't talked about it yet. Yeah. I'm just curious. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, so I, I keep on neglecting to mention this, um, but... Uh, Anybody watching live um, on the Hangout, if you, not in YouTube, but if you're watching on the Hangouts page, um, you can ask questions uh, in the Q&A app in Hangouts, and we will answer them here in a moment, actually. Um, and we don't have any questions, so you are very likely to be picked. <laughs> so um, before we go into the tips and picks, because we are winding down on our time, uh, does anybody have anything else they'd like to ask? or? Uh, do you all have anything else that you wanted to mention? And well, I, I wanted to know if um, there will be method to communicate with web workers uh, in the new HTTP library or something else, maybe? Um, uh, the, can you give a use case, the use case you're thinking of? Uh, it's just uh, abstracting post message and being able to communicate with a web worker like you would with a server. Oh, I see. I hadn't really thought of that, but that's interesting. I, so we are doing some work with web workers, some experimental stuff. Um, service workers, obviously, something that, that is on our mind. But um, we're also, um, another intern on the team is experimenting with running Angular completely in a web worker and uh, running all your application logic and then just serializing uh, instructions back to the main thread in order to render. So rendering happens on the main thread. Um, and as part of that, we're having to establish some kind of post message uh, contract between the, the two contexts. But um, I haven't really thought about HTTP as that. Though you could probably just create a different kind of backend to work with HTTP, uh, and then with dependency injection, bind it to, to take over uh, those requests. And I don't see any reason why you know, something like that could, work. could be interesting. I've never used web workers. Backend, I'll help you get started. <laughs> I've, I've never used web workers before, but I imagine that uh, if all my code ran in web workers, um, that might be a little bit of a pain to debug. Um, but like I said, I've never used it before, but that's, that would just be a concern I would have initially. But it yeah. sounds way cool. I'm sure it would introduce some challenges. Yeah. So um, awesome. I think uh, we're going to. Uh, go into our uh, tips and picks. Um, we don't have any questions, so we'll just jump in. Um, and I will pick on uh, Patrick. Do you have any tips or picks for us this week? Oh man, can I can I go last? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, okay, yeah. Let's go with uh, Jeff then. Okay, uh, so I am in the process of setting up a new production environment for a website I've been working on for a while now, like a past year, and uh, it's a pain. I hate I hate doing DevOps, but 
Uh, the one thing that I found that's really cool is this thing, Rundeck, rundeck.org, uh, that I'll post a link to. It's basically that if you have, you know, batch jobs on your servers, like, and you want something more than just, like, cron tab, but you don't want to go, like, crazy with some, there's, like, some really complex infrastructures you can have for um, your offline processes uh, in AWS and everything, and that sometimes that's too, too much. But Rundeck is just a simple UI that will... Um, reach out to your different instances and can run whatever you want and it's just uh, a great piece of software so I would highly recommend it. That's it for me. Thanks Jeff. Man, I was looking for something like this. This is perfect. So this, yeah, this will take the place of Jenkins from my ops guys for sure. Ray, uh, okay, Amy, uh, what do you have for us this week? I was going to pick a GitHub repo with a bunch of, uh, like, ES6 tutorials and stuff. It's, like, a good thing if you're bored, have nothing else to do. It's, like, a little Christmas present on Saturday morning if you have nothing to do all weekend. <laughs> so that's my pick. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, Olivier, what do you have for us? Um, I have two. Uh, the first one is uh, an article uh, from Nolan Lawson. Uh, which is uh, Safari is the new IE, and he made a second article where he's apologizing to the community because uh, he was a bit uh, too harsh in the first article. But um, it's really interesting to read, and I think that, uh, yeah, you should read it. And my other pick is um, a kudos to... Um, to Alex Young, uh, who just announced that uh, he will stop DailyGS, and this website has been uh, one of my main source for n articles and news on front-end development, so I just wanted to say thanks to him for making this blog. Cool. Um, I'll go ahead and go next. So I have three picks. First, um, this last weekend, um, I'm an American, so we celebrated the 4th of July, and um, we had a big family reunion. And not everybody knows this about me, but I have 11 brothers and sisters. And so we have a huge Holy family. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and I'm second to last, and so uh, all my brothers and sisters, or most of us are married and have kids, and so there were 63 people at this family reunion, just from my parents down family, kind of crazy. But uh, we had this, this shirt, and it says, keep calm because hard is good. And that is a, um, a saying that my mom used to have, uh, or used to say all the time, like, hard is good. Um, and I just wanted to, to pick uh, family because family is the best. And um, yeah, family's great. So go give your families hugs and kisses and stuff. Um, and then my next pick is uh, the concept of zero inbox. Um, I should find a link that, like, I'm sure there's a blog article about why Zero Inbox is so cool, but um, if you use Zero Inbox, then you will more rarely uh, miss things that um, that you need to take care of. So um, I pick Zero Inbox. And finally, um, my technical pick is JS Data. I use J I've used JS Data for about a year for all of my projects for Angular 1. Um, before, it was Angular, um, Angular Data, and... Um, yeah, now it's um, he, uh, Jason Debris, who was actually on the show. He pulled out Angular and made JS Data, and now there's the JS Data Angular. And um, yeah, it's an awesome project. Um, so super good for data management, and I recommend you check it out. Um, all right, so we'll save the best for last. Um, so Patrick, what do you, uh, do you did you find anything that you'd like to pick? Yeah, so um, if you Google Angular Two Education. There's this repo that has like a bajillion links on Angular 2, um, and there's a lot of example apps and live coding and everything. Uh, definitely check that out. The other thing I have is Twitter itself. Um, Twitter is great. A lot of people don't realize this, but uh, Twitter is great for conferences and just reaching out to people. For example, like if you uh, want to ask a question, you could just go on Twitter and ask us a question right away, and we could answer it right away. Um, so like if you're not on Twitter, that's that's another good reason to to be on Twitter. And if you go to any conferences, um, everyone connects through Twitter anyway, so you might as well uh, you know, deal with the game there. Yeah. <laughs> so, as you're moving around, the mustache is <laughs> yeah. all over the screen. It's hard to take you seriously, Patrick. <laughs> probably grow one. <laughs> and yeah, then just remove right. it, and then you'll just show my mustache, yeah. 
All right, cool. So for our guests, um, let's start with Ian. Um, so doing tips and tricks still, I'm guessing. So I was actually reading an article this morning because um, Alex, who's actually my host, and I have been discussing the differences between uh, hot and cold observables. Um, I'm still, I didn't actually know that observables existed before I, I got to Google this summer. So it's been pretty interesting for me. Um, but I found this article called The Introduction to Reactive Programming You've Been Missing. And I, after reading the documentation RX has, I found a few things to be a little inconcise and a little convoluted. And I think this guy has a very great understanding of observables after having worked with them for multiple years. And he gives a really intuitive and detailed approach to what reactive programming is and how to interact with observables and their differences. So if you're ever interested in observables or why maybe Angular finds value in them, uh, I thought this was a great article. And it's like, a, like I said, it's called The Introduction to Reactive Programming You've Been Missing. And I can post that. Cool. Jeff? Um, I have two. One is something I tweeted the other day. Uh, in this, the web platform tests project. And so a lot of people don't know about this, but the W3C has a whole repository of tests against native platform APIs that uh, you can run against browsers to see how well they comply. Um, but I actually use this as sometimes as an API reference because, um, you know, MDN is good uh, for reference for giving you kind of a high level here are the methods, here's what they do. Um, and specs are good, but they're really long, and you have to read through lots of words and lots of um, weird ways of describing algorithms. Uh, but these specs you can look at, you can see, um, if I'm encountering some weird behavior with XML HTTP requests, for example, I can look at how it's supposed to uh, behave in these specs and see, like, actually how it's testing them and see, okay, well, it's expected to work this way. And, um, and so that's why it is. Um, so that for me, it's a lot easier to look at specs and understand how something is supposed to work. That's at uh, GitHub slash W3C slash web dash platform dash tests. And the second thing is my pen. If you can see it, it's a Fisher Space Pen. Uh, so apparently you can write with it in space and zero gravity, so underwater and in rain. And what I like about it is how heavy it is because it's made of metal. And it folds up really nicely like this and clips in my pocket. And it just feels really nice to write with, but it's nice and sturdy in your hand. It writes really well. The ink is pressurized, and so it never you never have to scribble to get it to work again. Um, but this is this thing is a lightsaber. Fisher mm -hmm. Space Pen, and I don't get permission for selling it. When is your guide to the space station? Uh, <laughs> when the Google Space Program launches. Oh, okay. I, I remember actually. Sorry, just kind of tangential. But the first um, Google April Fool's joke I ever saw was their um, their moon office that they were going to build, um, and I totally thought it was legit. I was I was like 12 years old, but I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right, Alex, uh, what do you have for us? Yeah, so um, my pick is the Go programming language. Um, I do a lot of personal projects. I have an interest in distributed chat protocols and some other things. And um, a while back, I decided to teach myself Go and started using it. I've been really happy with the way the language works. Uh, they've cut out a lot of the complexity that you find in other, other languages. There's one simple way of doing things. Um, and you know, for a long time, it was hard for me to kind of describe what I liked about it. And then I realized that um, with Go, as opposed to any other language I've ever coded in, um, I feel like I write things correctly the first time more often. So I'll write code, and as long as you can get it past the compiler, it goes compiler is very good. Um, little error, for example, if you have an uneven input. Um, I find it just mo most of the time, or more often than other languages, it just works the way I intend it. So I encourage people to give it a try. So it doesn't transpire with JavaScript. So. Yeah, I was going to say JavaScript doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to wait for WebAssembly, and then we'll be good. I, I imagine, I don't know if you could compile Go to ASCII.js. I think it would um, be possible. Actually, I know you can go to LLVM. Actually, I do believe you can because if you use the Go compiler that's currently bootstrapped on top of GCC, because uh, I believe you can actually, yeah. there was somebody who did a hack with that to transpile Go to C++, and then you can go from ASM to Yeah, uh, so to it should work. Uh, <laughs> but also, like, for people who like mobile, I mean, Go is a, is an interested language for, or sorry, is an interested language as a replacement for Java on Android. 
So cool. All right. Um, so I'm going to double check the Q and A here. I think uh, no questions. So um, was there anything else um, that anybody just wanted to throw out there um, before we uh, wrap this up? Yeah, can you, uh, this is super late, but can you go over the app manifest uh, thing you mentioned earlier? What? <laughs> so for app well, when we talked about service worker, you mm -hmm. said, uh, yeah. go over <laughs> how it works. So yeah. the manifest is, is part of the application patch, the, uh, kind of the, the old way of doing offline. Um, and it, it has a lot of problems. Um, the one that, that I think um, was mentioned earlier that people often run into is if you don't um, if you don't set the cache headers of the manifest properly, then the browser will never actually download a new manifest and it won't realize that your HTML files have changed or that your JavaScript has changed, so it will never actually update your application. Okay, yeah. so don't use it. <laughs> the manifest, well, you guys call file. It's just a list of files that you you tell it. Cache these files with these paths, and then you get things that say explicitly require these from network all the time. These paths, and so look a lot of build processes that automatically generate them, and automatically generated things are more prone to doing the wrong thing. So, yeah, and if you happen to put the manifest file in your manifest file, then you will never ever get a new manifest file downloaded in your client. <laughs> you sound like you weren't <laughs> here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you just say cache everything in this public directory, then yeah, you're going to have problems. Yeah, the, the thing, sad thing is there are reasons why you would want to put your manifest file in your manifest file, but if you do it incorrectly, then everything will go crazy. All right, I think we need to end this show right now. Uh, <laughs> but if you're listening, you should watch. Um, okay, so I'll just go through some more announcements just to wrap us up, um, or, or repeat the announcements for those who came on late. So next week's show is July 14th about Angular Formly with yours truly and a guest host um, who will be really fun. Um, and then, uh, again, follow us on Twitter and Google+. Uh, we're at Angular Air, and catch us on the web at angular-air.com. Um, and with that, I think um, we're good to say thank you, uh, Jeff, Alex, and Ian, for uh, coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having thanks us. Very much. Well, see you around. Thank you.